Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first session of the symposium. You have today, for our first session, a panel of distinguished jurists and academics, and some of them are both judges and academics, <clears throat> who will share their thoughts with us on whether international commercial courts are a shooting star or a more permanent feature in the legal firmament. Um, I, first of all, I would like to call on Chief Justice James Alsop, Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Australia. Chief Justice Alsop, please. Thank you, Justice Prakash. It's a great privilege and a pleasure to participate in this symposium. The title to the session uh, posits a dichotomy, um, but there may be more to say about inspiration, organic growth and public purpose than frontier or trend. The notion of frontier connotes expansion and territorial reach for dealing with the marchlands or territories where there is no or little law. I do not think that to be an apt metaphor for insight for today. The description trend uh, connotes uh, fashion and change of behaviour or direction based on flow and perhaps a touch of caprice, devoid of organic force or drive. Again, such metaphor is not apt for necessary or appropriate insight here. Avowedly internationally focused uh, commercial courts or judicial chambers have emerged since 2004. They have sought to challenge the great sovereign commercial courts dealing with uh, international litigation, especially the London Commercial Court. Their inspiration for their rise can be readily understood. Um, by the turn of the 21st century, after nearly half a century of the effects of the New York Convention, on, there was an astonishing development of interconnected uh, arbitration and global commerce at a huge worldwide demand had grown for fair and just decision making. In many respects, the features of arbitration uh, most satisfactorily uh, catered that most, most satisfactorily to the needs of international commerce, um, contractually sourced and shaped the focus of its tribunal and its chosen skill and ability to ground procedure, um, gave rise uh, to uh, this huge demand. Um, but the activity of dispute resolution was matched by the development of international commercial law, model laws, principles, conventions, directions, uh, instruments on a whole host of uh, commercial topics uh, developed. Um, thus, the late 20th and early 21st centuries were a time of active development of international legal principles in a fertile environment of active global commerce. And out of this environment, which included not only the attractions of international commercial arbitration, but some of its perceived disadvantages, um, grew the idea of sovereign but internationally focused and organised courts. There was some concern uh, in Singapore, I recall, as to whether the SICC might undercut the arbitral work of the city. Such concerns were misplaced. Uh, there is a degree always of competition between methods of dispute resolution, but the complementarity of uh, court and arbitration is, uh, is much more important. Um, the capacity to populate an international chamber or court with expertise from all parts of the world uh, as, a, uh, as part of a domestic commercial court of excellence provides not only the opportunity uh, for primary and appellate commercial decision making of the highest quality, but also arbitral supervision of exceptional quality. So for uh, inspiration uh, of these courts is the sovereign attempt to, uh, by different jurisdictions, to participate uh, in the commerce of, as it were, of international dispute resolution. But its success will be organic in meeting the growing needs of commerce. This hybrid of international sovereignty and, interna and internationality in primary decision-making and appellate review 
uh, and arbitral supervision will bring forth, I'm sure, procedural innovation, uh, cross-fertilisation of procedural approaches, the development of harmonising principles and the growth of a Lex Mercatoria through convergence. Um, the idea of these kinds of uh, international, internationally focused um, uh, principles, um, similar to that, that which has developed over millennia in maritime law, uh, are not rosy dreams. Uh, they, are, they provide the underlying inspiration for international commercial law principles and international commercial law uh, and international commercial courts drawing their members uh, from around the world are apt to administer uh, chosen law or international commercial law uh, in a fashion to reflect this internationality. So in summary, I think that international commercial courts will take their place in moulding and developing an international system of justice in partnership with arbitral institutions, ad hoc arbitrations and national sovereign commercial courts. And I do not, do not think they are a fashion or a trend or new territory or frontier, but a strong and forceful part of a healthy organic growth of the international system of the rule of law in commerce. Thank you, Chief Justice Altsop. Next, may we please invite Sir Peter Gross, please. Good morning. Uh, the United Kingdom and Singapore have much to share. It is a pleasure and privilege to participate in the Singapore International Commercial Court Symposium and a delight that it has been reinstated. Uh, after the unavoidable COVID-19 adjournment. Spectacularly successful though Zoom is, I very much hope we will meet in person before too long. Commercial courts in their modern manifestation developed because of the need for expertise in resolving commercial disputes. Commercial courts are not a new phenomenon. Some date back centuries. Nonetheless, the modern expansion of commercial courts internationally is noteworthy, reflecting the role of commercial courts in supporting global trade uh, and the, the hybrid uh, of sovereignty and internationalism uh, as commented upon by Chief Justice Alsop. Uh, against this background, my answer to the question posed is neither. International commercial courts are neither the latest trend nor the next frontier. They are a central part of the international dispute resolution architecture. Uh, I would highlight seven hallmarks of commercial courts, all of which uh, apply to international commercial courts. One, impartiality and independence. First and foremost, the perception and reality that the judiciary is impartial and independent Litigants from all over are to be welcomed. There can be no home ground advantage. Two, purpose and ethos. The purpose of commercial law is to facilitate commerce. Within the court system, specialist commercial courts are best placed to foster a supportive ethos. Uh, case management, which CIFOC has prioritized, being a prime example. Three, expertise. Judicial expertise is indispensable to the mix and is best concentrated in commercial courts. Four, advancing the rule of law. A commercial court, which deals justly with foreign investors on the one hand and a local government authority on the other, makes a striking contribution to the rule of law internationally. Five, judicial innovation. As specialist courts with a focus on user needs, commercial courts are well placed to lead in the area of judicial innovation. Uh, consider uh, simply one example. Justice in commercial cases has not gone on hold during the pandemic. Commercial courts have readily adapted to remote or virtual hearings using Zoom, Teams, or whatever technology is available. This is a strikeless, striking achievement, seamlessly adopted. Six, 
coexistence with other forms of dispute resolution. As I have long argued, this is not a zero-sum game. Commercial courts and arbitration are complementary. Sensibly considered, they are not in competition. That is so in London, and so too in Singapore. And what is more, this coexistence is adaptable uh, and can readily take on board the multi-tier or holistic dispute resolution contemplated a few minutes ago by the Chief Justice in his opening address. Seven, cooperation between commercial courts internationally. Inevitably, the expansion of commercial courts will result in competition between them. Such competition need not, however, prove destructive, and to the contrary, its constructive features are fostered by CIFOP, as is the case of coexistence with arbitration or ADR, this is a win-win situation. Conclusion. To my mind, such as their role and value, it is difficult to imagine the international dispute resolution system for commercial disputes without thriving commercial courts, including international commercial courts. They are of cardinal importance to international trade and investment, together with serving to promote the rule of law. Commercial courts and other forms of dispute resolution are complementary, and commercial courts work best when cooperating with one another, notably under the CIFOC umbrella. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Peter. Next, may we please invite Judge Kevin Castell. Thank you and greetings to all. I agree with Chief Justice Menon that those negotiating commercial agreements are eager to find a neutral forum that can reliably and predict predictably resolve a future dispute between the parties. For some, an international commercial court with the right characteristics offers distinct advantages over arbitration. Arbitration awards can be based on an arbitrator's subjective belief of what is fair rather than the dictates of the plain language of a contract. And as we know, by design, there's no avenue of review of an arbitrator's decision. But where the stakes are high, parties want more than a swift, inexpensive, and certain result. They want a correct result. And many have learned arbitration is not always swift or inexpensive. Now, the ideal international commercial court applies established evidentiary and procedural rules that were known to the parties at the time of contracting. Decisions on the merits should be clear and well-reasoned and grounded in the record. The decision should be publicly available for the world to see and frankly assess. It's this available body of judicial decisions that builds confidence. And if there is a belief that the court in the first instance got it wrong, there's a meaningful avenue of review. You must look at this from the standpoint of parties doing the negotiations. They are the ones who will decide whether this is the next frontier or the latest trend. I submit that 10 factors will be important to these negotiators. The availability of pool of judges experienced in handling commercial disputes, foreign work study will be uh, valuable, and of course, a system which is free from external influence. Second in importance is a pool of highly experienced and competent lawyers who can handle the commercial litigation and the right of a party to have its home country lawyer meaningfully participate in strategy and presentation of evidence. Third, the choice of color or civil law principles. Fourth, comfort level with the approved languages and the availability of certified interpreters. Fifth, ease of travel. Sixth, availability of local resources, digital imaging, technological support, 
availability of daily transcripts of proceedings. Seventh, predictable and reliable scheduling by the court, which accommodates the needs of witnesses and the parties without prolonging the proceedings. Eighth, prompt trial and prompt decision making. Ninth, a robust system of appellate review. And finally, tenth, confidence that the court's judgment will be enforceable in other countries. Now, what do the parties to a proceeding in an ICC expect from other countries around the world. A potential obstacle to the success of ICCs is the reluctance of some courts to enforce an exclusive forum clause where the forum bears no relationship to the controversy or is perceived as distant and inconvenient. I'm pleased to report that as far back as 1972, the United States Supreme Court ruled on the side of an exclusive forum, an international agreement, even where it bore no relationship to the parties or controversies. The court said that these forum selection cause clauses, quote, are an indispensable element in international trade, commerce, and contracting by reducing uncertainties. It noted that a party who has freely agreed to a party uh, to a forum can hardly complain that that forum is inconvenient. Federal courts invalidate an international forum clause only when the resisting party satis satisfies the heavy burden of showing that it would, quote, be unfair, unjust, or unreasonable to hold the party to their own bargain. While the analogy is not perfect, the experience in the United States holds promise for ICCs in other respects. In the States, we have the Courts of New York and Delaware, which have proven to be popular forums for litigation, even if the controversy bear little relationship with, with them. Private parties will have the final say on the degree of acceptance of any particular forum. If reputations for predictability and reliability, such as that developed by Singapore, have been built, acceptance will grow. Uh, courts that already enjoy this reputation, like Singapore, will have an easier time in gaining acceptance. I thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Judge Castell. Next, may we please invite Justice Anselmo Reyes. Thank you. I would like to suggest that Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS, is, is essentially akin to carrying out a proportionality assessment. A tribunal assesses whether there has been a breach of no less favorable treatment, most favored nation, MFN, fair and equitable treatment, FET, or anti-expropriation clauses by balancing the legitimate expectations of an investor against the legitimate objectives of a state. If this is right, it is difficult to see why a tribunal consisting of three arbitrators, a co-arbitrator selected by the state, a co-arbitrator selected by the investor, and a presiding arbitrator selected by the two co-arbitrators, should, merely by reason of their selection, have the authority, knowledge, or experience to decide how a proportionality or balancing exercise should be carried out. This is especially the case where a tribunal's decision will inevitably touch on a state's development priorities and policies and affect the lives of the state's ordinary citizens. As a result, there has been dissatisfaction with the current state of ISDS. The European Union has sought to address the situation by setting up a multilateral investment court, MIC. The MIC is still at the discussion stage. A possible way in which the MIC would operate may be gleaned from the 2018 EU-Singapore Investment Protection Agreement, not yet in force. As a means of resolving ISDS, the latter provides for the establishment of a tribunal of first instance and an appeal tribunal. 
Singapore and the EU each nominate two members to the first instance and appellate tiers. The two state parties then jointly nom nominate two further members to each tier, neither of whom is to be a Singapore or EU national. Members of the first instance tribunal should possess the qualifications required in the respective countries for appointment to judicial office. Members of the appellate tribunal should possess the qualifications required in the respective countries for appointment to the highest judicial offices. If this model gains traction beyond the EU to other countries, there will need to exist networks of international commercial courts, including appellate courts, staffed by international judges, some nationals of the countries party to the relevant agreement, others not. What might the future look like under a regime of such networks? Hard or soft law instruments for the enforcement of the judgments of such tribunals will have to be worked out. But this should not be difficult, particularly if the judgments of the networks of tribunals can be treated as court decisions of the states party to a relevant bilateral or multilateral investment treaty. A universal procedure for the courts it is submitted would also need to be worked out. Here, the forthcoming SICC rules can serve as a possible model. This is because the new SICC rules are the product of discussions among civil and common law judges, are couched in plain English, the lingua franca of ISDS, and allow for flexibility so that a case is progressed as appropriate through one of three tracks, a pleadings, statements, or memorials track. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the use of remote technology in the hearing of transnational commercial cases. This phenomenon, coupled with the existence of networks of international commercial courts, should open up possibilities for ISDS. ISDS can be delocalized, where international commercial courts have judges from different countries in different time zones, the problems associated with a court's geographical location and time zone may be overcome, in particular through the use of asynchronous hearings. Because everything is done remotely, the cost of travel and hotel accommodation will be minimized. The carbon footprint of stakeholders will likewise be minimized. It has been argued in France that international commercial courts are only for the rich who can afford them. But remote technology should bring the cost of ISDS down to an affordable level so that even MSMEs will benefit. Obviously, protocols to ensure due process will have to be worked out. We will need to become accustomed to the implications of the new normal. Nonetheless, future benches of national and foreign judges drawing on their combined experience and expertise and working together to resolve investment disputes can lead to a body of authoritative case precedents and greater coherence and certainty in ISDS. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Reyes. May we now invite Professor Yu Tiong Min, please. Thank you. Uh, I am very grateful for the privilege of uh, addressing this symposium. I will focus on the global framework for foreign judgments and its specific relevance to international commercial courts. Now, one key pillar of a global network of international commercial courts is party autonomy, giving effect to contracting parties' agreement to have the dispute resolved in their chosen court. The 2005 Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements lays the groundwork for the cross-border enforcement of commercial judgments. The three key objectives of this convention are one, the exclusively chosen court of a contracting state will hear the case. Two, non-chosen courts of other contracting states will not hear the case unless one of the exceptional circumstances enumerated in the convention applies. Three, a judgment from the exclusively chosen court will be recognized and enforced across all other contracting states subject to limited defenses. <laughs> this convention currently applies in 32 countries, Mexico, member states of the EU, the UK from the end of the Brexit transition, Singapore and Montenegro. US and China and Macedonia and Ukraine are signatory states as well, but they have not implemented the convention. 
Countries like Australia and Canada have signaled interest in the convention, but understandably there are many uh, distractions from legislative uh, time at the moment. The convention is gradually gaining momentum. The, last the latest country to sign being uh, Israel just last week. In comparison, the New York Convention for the Enforcement of Arbitral Awards has 163 signatory countries, but we must remember that it took nearly 20 years from its inception before it really gained momentum in terms of the number of uh, signatory states. Also important is the 2019 Hague Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters. The 2019 convention generally complements the 2005 convention in setting out the circumstances outside the 2005 convention on when a civil and commercial judgment may be recognized or enforced. <clears throat> in three particular areas, it works to protect party autonomy in tandem with the 2005 convention. First, the 2005 Convention only applies to exclusive choice of court agreements, though a choice of court clause will be deemed exclusive unless the parties have expressly uh, indicated otherwise. Uh, there is controversy whether asymmetric clauses are exclusive for this purpose. These are unilateral choice of court agreements frequently used in commercial contracts in common law systems. Typically, one party must sue uh, the other in the, a chosen jurisdiction, while the other can sue in any jurisdiction. Banks in particular are partial to these clauses because it ensures that it can only be sued in its own jurisdiction while being able to pursue debtors wherever their assets may be found. Now, some English High Court decisions have tentatively taken the view that these clauses are exclusive for the purpose of the 2005 Convention. On the other hand, the explanatory report to the Convention says quite clearly that they are not. The 2019 Convention will allow for the circulation of foreign judgments if the defendant has consented to the jurisdiction of the originating court in any choice of court agreement falling outside the 2005 Convention. The result is that asymmetric choice of court clauses can be the basis for the cross-border recognition or enforcement of foreign judgments under one Convention or the other. Practically all kinds of choice of law agreements will be covered between these two Conventions. Second, there is some doubt whether the 2005 Convention applies to an exclusive choice of court clause in the trust instrument because beneficiaries taking an, an interest under uh, such an instrument may have consented but perhaps not agreed to the terms of the instrument. Such clauses will be covered under the 2019 Convention. Third, the 2019 Convention provides that a contracting state <coughs> may refuse recognition or enforcement of a foreign judgment if the proceedings in the foreign court had been commenced in breach of a choice of court clause. This is perhaps something that should have been included in the 2005 Convention in the first place to give it greater bite. Be that as it may, it, is now, uh, it now can be found in the 2019 Convention. Now, the 2019 Convention has not yet entered into force. Uh, there are three signatory states so far, Uruguay, Ukraine and Israel from just last week. None have uh, ratified. So with the 2005 Convention as complemented by the 2019 Convention, an international framework exists for the cross-border recognition and enforcement of judgments from international commercial courts. What is needed is for more countries to sign up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yeo. May we now invite Associate Professor Adeline Chong, please. Thank you. It is a privilege to participate in the SICC Symposium. I would also like to deal with the enforcement of international commercial court judgments by focusing first on the various cooperative mechanisms which are in place between certain courts and secondly, the Asian principles for the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. On the first point, the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts has concluded a multilateral memorandum on enforcement of commercial judgments on money. In the memorandum, each court sets out the procedures for the enforcement of a foreign judgment under its laws. A number of ICCs, such as the SICC and the IFC courts, have also concluded bilateral memoranda of guidance with their counterparts. These bilateral memoranda also set out the requirements that have to be fulfilled 
for the cross-border enforcement of money judgments in each other's jurisdiction. Although these memoranda are not legally binding, they do send a strong signal of judicial committee and cooperation between the participating courts and to that end, help to enhance the perception that international commercial court judgments are readily enforceable. To ascertain the degree to which an international commercial court judgment would be enforceable in Asia, it would be helpful to refer to the Asian principles for the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. This is a project conducted under the auspices of the Asian Business Law Institute, ABLI, which is a research institute based in Singapore. The Asian Principles covers the 10 ASEAN member states and five of ASEAN's major trade partners, i.e. Australia, China, India, Japan and South Korea. The Asian Principles is an attempt to state the common principles in the foreign judgment rules in these 15 countries and explore the differences in the laws. Setting aside Indonesia and Thailand, which do not generally enforce foreign judgments, the basic foreign judgments framework across the countries in the ABLI study is similar, although there are of course differences in terms of the details. For example, common principles include that the judgment must be on the merits, the court of origin must have international jurisdiction, and the judgment must be final. Grounds of refusal include fraud and lack of due process. Most of the international commercial courts would assume jurisdiction if the parties have consented to its jurisdiction, such as by way of a choice of court agreement. The ABLI study found that most laws would respect a choice of court agreement and recognize that the chosen court had international jurisdiction to hear the case. In addition, International commercial courts are staffed by experienced judges, which generates a level of confidence in the judgments. It would seem unlikely for a judgment from an international commercial court to be refused enforcement on the basis of grounds such as fraud or lack of due process. However, the civil law countries impose a requirement of reciprocity, and in Merck and Merck, an important and recent decision of the Singapore Court of Appeal, the court alluded to the possibility that reciprocity could be a precondition to the recognition of foreign judgments under Singapore common law rules. The treatment of the principle of reciprocity varies. In some countries, a treaty relationship is required. Under Japanese and South Korean laws, the expectation of receiving reciprocal treatment suffices. Whereas under Chinese law, it has to be shown that the court of origin had previously enforced a Chinese judgment. However, the judicial representatives of China and the ASEAN countries have adopted the Nanning Statement, a non-binding consensus, in 2017. Under the Nanning Statement, the enforcing court will presume the existence of a reciprocal relationship, provided the court of origin has not refused to enforce a judgment from the country of the enforcing court on ground of lack of reciprocity. Depending on which version of reciprocity is adopted by the enforcing court and how far courts adhere to the Nanning Statement, the International Commercial Court judgment may not be enforced due to lack of reciprocity, and this gap may be plucked by encouraging countries to sign up to the Hague Conventions. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone, for those interesting and informative um, presentations. They have generated a number of questions. Um, in particular, I think <coughs> that Justice Reyes' point about um, investor state dispute resolution um, processes being dealt with by a international court has um, enthused certain participants. So I would, without further ado, put a few questions to Justice Reyes. The first one is, could the SICC position itself to hear investor state disputes? <coughs> if so, um, which features of the SICC would make it particularly suited to hear such disputes? 
And I mean, connected with that is another ca um, question, which is what would motivate parties to select the SICC as the forum for their investor state dispute resolutions? Resolution. Please, um, Professor Reyes. That's Justice Reyes and Professor Reyes. Thank you very much. Uh, the three questions are rather difficult questions. Uh, let me start with the easiest one. What is the position of the SICC at the moment in relation to investor state uh, disputes? In fact, the Singapore court is currently handling investor state disputes. Uh, there have been a number of decisions by the Singapore court, not necessarily the SICC, but a number of decisions of the Singapore court dealing with the, the recourse against awards uh, against the state in uh, international arbitration. For instance, there is a decision relating to the government of La Laos. There are other decisions, and there's a, a very good decision by uh, Justice Ramesh Kanan that reviews all, a lot of the investor treaty law. Uh, that has gone off the appeal, and the appeal judgment is also a good review of investor treaty law. So um, I think the easiest way or the most ready way in which the SICC can deal with investor state disputes is through its arbitration, its supervision of international arbitrations with a Singapore seat. A number of investor arbitrations have a Singapore seat and those could be dealt with by the SICC. That would be within the jurisdiction of the SICC. Second, what about the future? How can it position, how can the SICC position itself? I thought about this a lot, but it is a challenge because typically investor state disputes arise out of a dispute resolution clause in a bilateral investment treaty or a multilateral investment treaty. And typically such treaty will specify a number of different ways, including exit arbitration, ad hoc arbitration of the UNCITRAL rules, perhaps a, a, some sort of special ad hoc tribunal, a number of ways in which disputes arising out of a treaty can be resolved. What the SICC would like to do or would need to do really is position itself, put itself as one of the alternatives to um, um, a result, resolution of a dispute arising out of an investor state to treaty. I think the likeliest possibility for that would be a treaty relating to ASEAN countries. Uh, ASEAN has in fact a such a treaty, but that was done I think in 2009 before the SICC came into existence. Should the, uh, should the treaty be renegotiated or reviewed, it might be possible to include the SICC as one of the avenues or one of the ways in which the parties to um, the um, uh, treaty uh, can resolve disputes between themselves, between the state and an investor. Apart from that, um, what would the, uh, how to motivate parties to use the SICC? I think here, the SICC um, would, um, what sells the SICC would be the qualities referred to by the Chief Justice a moment ago in the Chief Justice's opening remarks. The availability of international judges, um, the international judges who would be neutral and impartial, um, who are well known and who are, are able to speak with authority on the matters that are raised in investor state disputes. I think that would be the selling point of the SITC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, following on from that, actually, we have a question, which I think I would put to you, Justice Reyes, and to Sir Peter Gross, which is, um, you know, the system of the SICC is that although we have a panel of international judges drawn from various jurisdictions, the allocation of the judges to hear the various disputes is done by the court and not by the parties. So the question that I have from a participant is, would allowing parties to nominate their judges on international commercial courts, like um, in the same way that parties to an arbitration can nominate their arbitrators, be beneficial or detrimental to international commercial courts? Perhaps, Sir Peter, you could um, answer this first, if you don't mind. 
No, it's a pleasure. Um, but the question is not an easy one. In arbitration, one takes it for granted that the parties choose their tribunal. Uh, in a court, uh, all my instincts tell me that the court lists the case uh, for the judge who should hear it, uh, rather than leaving it to the parties to choose their judges. The question causes one perhaps to re-examine those assumptions. Uh, I think where I'd leave it is where it currently is, that the court, and it must be the court, it can't be anyone outside the court, chooses the judge rather than letting the parties engage in judge shopping. That is a feature of a court uh, and somehow different uh, from the consensual form of arbitration. Perhaps by agreeing to the court's jurisdiction, uh, the parties are to be assumed to accept that the court will make those listing decisions. Thank you. Um, Justice Reyes, anything I, to I add? Agree entirely. I agree entirely with uh, Sir Peter uh, on the matter. I think it is important that it is the court that chooses the judges, not the parties. Look what happens today in investor state dispute settlement, in investor treaty uh, arbitration. Um, the parties, especially when a lot of money rides on a case, uh, the parties play a game of trying to engineer a tribunal that they believe suits their case. So one uh, a, a legal rep representative, a law firm uh, for one of the parties will engage in a complicated calculus where they say, well, if we nominate this person to act as arbitrator, who are the other side likely to nominate? And these two arbitrators, who are they likely to nominate as presiding arbitrator? Well, we don't like the, what this other, uh, potential presiding arbitrator has said about um, this uh, sort of case or this sort of issue. So maybe we should nominate someone else. It becomes an expensive game. Courts, uh, where courts choose uh, the judge or judges hearing a case, I think will get rid of this uh, ca costly calculus and uh, enable a dispute to get right to the point of trying to resolve the dispute. Thank you. Um, would Justice Chief Justice Alsop or Judge um, Castell like to comment on this as well? It's an interesting question. Uh, I had occasion to think about this a little while ago, a few years ago, when uh, there was some consideration of having a, a variety of appeal regimes for the parties to choose from if they wished, such as full rehearing on fact and law, uh, appeals limited to a question of law, that is to give the, the parties a, a choice in litigation as to how their appellate structure would be carried out. And the question arose when the parties would be able to choose that, um, uh, when they knew who their trial judge was or before they knew who their trial judge was. Because for some trial judges, it might be thought they were so reliable on facts, it was a waste of money to have an appeal on a question of fact. Um, but this very same issue arose with my colleagues when we were discussing this. The, the, pro, the, 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 the suggestion never got, uh, never moved forward. But there was this same point that it would create a sense of um, rivalry amongst the court, which would not be good for court uh, collegiality uh, if some judges were seen to be more favoured by uh litigants by reference to how their appeal regime was chosen and, and similarly if they get to choose their judge uh i'm not sure that it is good for the court as a court to have that kind of uh, internal competition or a sense thank of you. internal thank you i, I would thank add you. to yes. that if i may yes. that there are different models in court systems around the globe as to how uh, judges are assigned. In the federal courts in the U.S., there is a ri random assignment system. And this is 
thought to be very attractive to litigants because no one can game the system. No one need fear that there is a hand behind the scene that is steering a case to a particular judge. If there's confidence in the bench, then that randomness is actually considered an attractive feature, uh, immunizing uh, the adjudication from even an internal influence within the court. Thank you. Um, can I ask another, another question related to the difference between arbitration and um, court procedures? And um, this picks up on a point that Judge Castell made, talking about the importance of publishing judgments and making the decisions available to all so that one can understand how it was made and why it was made, and you can also develop the law from that. But in arbitration, one of the attractive features is that the arbitration is completely private and no one outside the parties ever gets to see the arbitral award. This, to me, this does not um, promote development of the law. But on the other hand, when it is a commercial matter, perhaps the party's interest in privacy can sometimes be more important. Should commercial courts accommodate this sort of desire by, um, in perhaps selected cases, agreeing to keep everything private, including the decisions. Um, perhaps, Judge Castell, you could um, start. Yes. Well, uh, of course, there are uh, cultural and historical norms in play. When you have uh, a court operating under a sovereign government, that court is funded by taxpayer dollars. And the higher norm is that the, in our system at least, is that the public has presumption of access to what that court is doing. So uh, it, it depends on some, whether something is a judicial document. If it's integral to the judge's decision, the court's decision, uh, and of course the ultimate outcome, then there is a presumption of access at which can be overcome if we're talking about a trade secret, customer lists, or matters that need to remain uh, private. But so much of what goes on in commercial litigation doesn't fall into that category. So you have to make as a system a judgment what is the higher value? And um, in my system, we come out in favor of that public access. Thank you. Um, so Peter, as an arbitrator now and a judge of appeal previously, what is your position on this? Uh, th thank you very much. My position is simple. I think if parties want confidentiality or privacy, they can choose arbitration, and that's one of its principal advantages. I think if they choose to go down a court route, that comes with the choice of public or open justice, save for the very rare case uh, where uh, the particular facts of the matter require confidentiality, and that is a very rare case indeed. So. Um I mean, perhaps Justice Alsop and Justice Reyes would agree with that because we are all common law judges and this is the system we operate. But for a commercial court, would that be off-putting to parties? Um, should, we, should we worry about it being off-putting to parties? Maybe I should put it that way. Um, Justice Alsop? I, I, I generally agree with Sir Peter in, with this I'm not sure it's a qualification. I've always thought that without um, undermining that sense of open justice, which is the strength of 
having the court as opposed to a private arbitration, I think, gives it, it underpins the confidence in the court um, that parties should be confident that their, their confidences and secrets will be protected in a reasonable way. Um, that doesn't mean uh, one panders to every wish, but I think for any court to have the confidence of the commercial community, they need to be able to come to it or be brought to it with a confidence that their real confidences or their fears of confidences being breached or plundered are to be protected. Now, that doesn't mean that it's whatever they want. But uh, with that qualification, I think the openness of the system is the hallmark of the alternative offering, if you like. It's the, it's the hallmark of the strength that of the um, of of the uh, independence and uh, sovereign capacity to deliver justice. Thank you. Um, I will now move to enforcement. There are a couple of questions for directed at Professor Yo. Um, Oh, yes. The question is, in view of the Hague Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Judgments, what would further enhance the recognition and enforcement of judgments overseas? And how would this improve the long-term success and sustainability of international commercial courts? Two parts to a question for you, Professor Yo. <laughs> Well, um, I, I think that the two questions essentially addresses the uh, same point, the really the circulation of uh, judgments coming out of uh, international commercial courts. And <clears throat> the, I mean, I, I think the point is actually very straightforward. Uh, it's what I said in the, the last sentence of my presentation. We need more countries to sign on to these conventions to give the conventions a uh, greater bite. The, the Hague Convention, the 2005 Convention, uh, we, we have 32 signatories already. And uh, uh, I mean, but, but uh, we have very big players at the EU in it, and we have uh, countries like the US and, and, and China already uh, uh, signed on, just uh, doing the implementation, working out the implementation. So, so it, it looks set to be a very important uh, instrument uh, moving ahead, and, and that is going to be the key uh, uh, instrument, I think, for the circulation of judgments from uh, international commercial courts. But uh, it, it, it doesn't give the complete picture because it only deals with exclusive choice of court agreements. And there are many, many dispute resolution agreements which are not exclusive choice of court agreements uh, for the purpose of the 2005 convention. And that's, and that's why where the 2019 convention uh, becomes uh, important. And, and really, I think um, it's a bit uh, too early to say, uh, uh, and, and I mean, the fact that we have three countries so far, I think is a good sign already, but I, I think uh, we, we need more countries signing up. And it's a bit unfortunate that uh, the conclusion of the 2019 convention occurred just shortly before this uh, pandemic business, because a number of conferences which were intended to publicize the uh, convention were, were cancelled or postponed as a result of it. So th there is a question of uh, you know, consciousness uh, that, that there is this convention and what this convention can do. Um, and, and, and so this is something that needs to be worked on to, uh, moving forward. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, just one more point. I mean, isn't... Isn't there too much emphasis on conventions and not enough recognition <coughs> of other ways in which judgments can be enforced? And I ask this question because one of the questions before me is, is not an international arbitration award better with respect to enforcement purposes since more countries have ratified the New York Convention. And so the answer to that, if you just look at number of signatories to conventions, would perhaps be yes. 
But I wonder, perhaps, um, Professor Yeo or Professor Chong, whether you could enlighten the participants about other possible ways of enforcement without regard just to the conventions. Um, if, if I may just make a quick uh, couple of points in response to that. Uh, um, first, I think um, as the, the New York Convention, of course, has had the advantage of time, right? It was signed in 1958. The, uh, the 2005 convention really only took effect in 2015, so there's, there's a bit of a, a, a head start there. Uh, but I, I, uh, one of the points that was mentioned by the Chief Justice uh, in his opening address was this issue about third parties. So there's actually some difference in the two regimes, and uh, because in, uh, if you go to a, a court, it is possible to get judgments against third parties. Right, whereas you can't do that uh, in, in arbitration, and that has uh, downstream effects in terms of uh, enforcement. Right, in terms of other matters, of course, I, I think that one cannot look at the global framework of conventions in isolation, and uh, it has to be seen as working with uh, other uh, means of recognition and enforcement at uh, national levels uh, in terms of. Uh, national laws in terms of non-law methods, in fact, uh, uh, and I'll leave that to uh, Adeline to talk about in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the memoranda of understanding and so on and so forth. So, so the point is we cannot rely on international conventions alone, but I think that international conventions can provide a very good platform uh, being one of the ways to uh, 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 recognize and enforce uh, judgments. Thank you. Thank you. And perhaps, Adeline, you could add to that the various ways in which SICC judgments are enforceable yes. abroad. Yeah. Well, uh, countries could uh, conclude bilateral treaties with each other. And in that, that's the case uh, uh, in the ABR st studies. A number of the countries involved in that study uh, have concluded bilateral treaties on foreign judgments with each other. And further to that, some countries also have in place special statutory schemes to register foreign judgments under which uh, countries which are gazetted under these schemes would be given preferential treatment in the sense that uh, there's an easier route towards enforcement. So Singapore, for example, has the Reciprocal Enforcement of Foreign Judgments Act. Uh, and further to that, the memoranda, the various memoranda which have been concluded, they are not legally binding, but they do send a strong signal, as I said, uh, of a judicial committee. It's also a signal that for countries under which uh, reciprocity is a precondition, it sends a strong signal that that court considers that there's reciprocity uh, between itself and the, the counterpart to the memorandum. Thank you. Yes, and I believe that in the common law system, it is not uh, it is always possible to enforce a judgment from another commonwealth court by an action on the judgment the old traditional way is always available is that correct yes yes but we have a common law action uh, uh, not just for so commonwealth we, judgment for any judgment for any country. any judgment thank you thank you for the expansion um yes so i think that this question of enforceability of um, SICC judgments and is not as um, big a question as it's sometimes made out to be. No doubt there is the New York Convention which deals with the with arbitration awards and that sets out very clear procedure. But even without that access to that convention, there are various means and ways of um, enforcing the judgments of the SICC. And I don't think parties, in fact, the SICC has probably produced some, some information on this, as far as I remember. Um, and so therefore parties should not, should not be worried about that aspect of an SICC judgment. Um, is, there, is there anything, I don't have any further questions from the participants, the audience. Um, is there anything else anyone, a man, member of the panel would like to add? If not, I think we've come to the end of our session, perhaps overrun it a little bit. Thank you very much, everyone, for all the work you have put in and for get, giving us such interesting um, presentations and, in, and dealing with these questions, which are important to all of us who are engaged in the business of promoting international commercial courts.
Thank you. Thank you for spending the time with us today and for all the work you've done before that.